what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a question perhaps very similar to what a, uh, a young athlete faces, and uh, perhaps in this fashion, and ask themselves this question. And I don't want to put off any Maple Leaf fans who are very disappointed that last night wasn't the opening game as it should have been, but just in a general tone. What must you do to make it into the NHL? Well, of course, you have to start by being willing to play, and we're not going to get into the politics of that right now. Two things really come to mind if you want to be an athlete, an NHL star, a football star, whatever it might be. The first of it is you have to work on your skills, all kind of skills. I think back to when my uh, oldest son was playing some hockey here in Orangeville, and we'd go out and see the... Uh, the uh, practices and they would work on their shooting and their skating and uh, passing a little bit of checking here and there all of the skills that were involved in becoming a successful and achieving athlete but there's a, another whole element to becoming a successful athlete no matter what the sport may be there is of course the skills the work that has to go into the skills no matter what the, the particular game or sport might be but secondly and perhaps even more importantly there's the whole internal strength that has to be built up. The commitment to the game, the commitment to fellow players, the commitment to be positive in attitude and, and uh, positive in looking ahead to what is required to become a successful player and a successful team. To be positive, to be focused not just on yourself, but to be focused on working with others. So there's the two aspects, really, of becoming a successful NHL player or CFL player or Olympic athlete, there's the skills, the individual particular skills that need to be mastered, and it takes a lot of work individually, and determination to master those particular skills that go along with that sport. But then there is the attitude that's common to every athlete, an attitude of being positive, of being determined, of being committed. The internal aspects and the external aspects come together. That's why a lot of teams, professional teams, Olympic teams these days, have sports psychologists that go along with the teams and, and work on not just the skills, but the attitude, to make sure the attitude is right before they enter into those sports. You know, Jesus would have been a very good coach. I don't know if it says anywhere in the Bible that he coached a, a sports team. I don't think it does. But he would have been an excellent coach because he had an understanding as he dealt with his disciples of both the internal requirements and the external requirements that are there before any of us who would be followers, disciples, successful as we follow Jesus. In the spiritual realm, there's these two same aspects. And Jesus met a man one day who wanted to talk to him about success, success in the spiritual realm in particular. And so he comes to Jesus so he says he, he ran along beside Jesus. He was so eager to have this conversation. He caught up to Jesus as Jesus was passing by his village. And he says to Jesus, what must I do in the spiritual realm to succeed? To be an achiever, to be a gold medalist in the spiritual realm. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus puts the question back to him almost immediately. And he says, do you, have you ever heard of the Ten Commandments? Do not murder, do not kill, do not defraud, uh, honor your father and mother, and on and on Jesus goes. He lists off, in other words, the, the skill requirements to become a, a successful disciple of the kingdom of God, to be a disciple of Jesus himself. The skills that are required are the external requirements of any disciple of the kingdom of God, of Jesus. Obey the commandments. So Jesus puts this question right back to the man who wants to know about being a successful spiritual person. He says, have you kept all these, these vows? Yes, he says, I have kept them all. Not just these ten that Jesus lists, and Jesus only lists six, actually, but the ten commandments, but all the other commandments I have kept since I was a boy. And you imagine that this is a, a young man that's graduated from the synagogue school. He's memorized the commandments. He's memorized parts of the, the scriptures. He's studied with the, uh, the Pharisees. He knows the externals. He knows the skill package that's required to be a successful spiritual person in the Jewish life. So that part, no problem. 
I've got that down pat, he says back to Jesus. The skill level, no problems at all. My skills are excellent. I've kept all of the commandments, all of them, since I was a boy. I went to synagogue school, memorized the commandments, debated with the scribes and the Pharisees, no problem. He was pretty sure that if God was keeping a checklist, if Jesus was keeping some sort of checklist, like a coach does at the practice for a, a hockey team or a sports team, that there would be no question that he would be making the team, making the cut. You know what I mean? You've been to sports practices and you've seen your kids make the cut or not make the cut, and either the, the coach, kind of like Coach Judy over here, where is Coach Judy? She knows all about challenging the kids to make the cut, to achieve their skills. Well, the, this young man says, no problem. I am sure I'm going to make the cut, Jesus. I've got all the skills down pat. In fact, if, if uh, you were to hold up a, a scoreboard right now, it would be, be tens right across the board. You know the Olympic scoring system? Tens across the board. Absolutely. He was certain that he was succeeding. But Jesus, like any good coach, knew there were also internal realities. Not just the external skills, not just the, the package of skills to be an achieving spiritual athlete, but also the internals. Like every coach, he knew there were great internal realities that also needed to be mastered. And so Jesus puts it a little bit deeper to this man as he challenges him to think about his commitment. He says, and somehow Jesus knew about this man. I don't know if Jesus had that way perhaps to perceive or perhaps one of his disciples had said, you know who this man is that's talking to you, Jesus? Yes, he's, he's pretty, uh, pretty skilled spiritually, but he's also rich. Ask him about that, Jesus. Maybe one of the disciples is saying behind the scene. However, Jesus knew that this man was rich. He challenged him directly in that regard. He said, if you really want to follow me, yes, keeping those commandments, you're doing great. Yep tens across the board, but there's more to it than that. There is also the internal factors, the internal realities, the internal issues that will make or break you as a spiritually successful disciple of mine. And here's how I want you to judge how you're doing on the internals. You're doing fine on the externals, but on the internals. Here's what I want you to do. Give away all your money. Give away all your money to the poor. Walk away from it all and follow me. And immediately the man began to balk. He knew Jesus knew him for who he was. A rich man. Yes, he knew the externals very well, but he was also a rich man who had commitments to keep. Who had commitments that he'd made to himself about a level of, of style of living. He was rich. He had benefits that went with that package. And he wasn't willing to give it up. Jesus hit him right on the raw nerve of his internal commitment that just wasn't there. For a few moments talking to this young man, Jesus discovered that he, his pursuit of spiritual achievement had one flaw, one huge flaw, one huge area of difficulty internally. He loved money more than he loved God. Give away all your money and follow me. You know, that's one thing to say, give away all your money with maybe the hope of making it back again if he kept his businesses going on the side. But Jesus says one more thing. He says, give it all away. Give it all away and then follow me. Knowing full well what this man saw as he looked at Jesus and his disciples, these weren't rich men, these weren't businessmen. They weren't succeeding. In fact, they didn't even seem to be concerned about material achievement and success. They were itinerant disciples of Jesus. And Jesus was simply an itinerant carpenter's son from Nazareth who didn't seem to have any concern about making money or prospects for material gain. And now he's asking me to give all my money away and then give away the prospect of gaining more money by following this itinerant carpenter? Too much. Jesus was not saying that there was something wrong with money. George and I can have a conversation about that. Jesus wasn't saying there's anything wrong with money. He's simply looking into the heart of this man and saying, where are your priorities? What is first and foremost in your heart? I remember my dad talking about uh, 
very often about a, a wonderful Christian man who was the CEO or president of Caterpillar Tractors and a devout Christian man. And he was known to give away not just a tithe, but uh, I forget what the percentage of his, of his givings to his church. And he just gave away and gave away, and God blessed him, it seemed, with more and more success in his business. This man clearly had a sense of priorities. He gave away and gave away, and God blessed him. There was nothing wrong with the material achievement. But for this man, the problem was that that was first and foremost. That was his first priority. Money and not God. And the story tells us that this young man walked away from Jesus that day, brokenhearted, sad, because he was rich. And not just that he was rich, but that that was his first priority, even though he thought, wouldn't it be great to be Jesus' disciple? He was good at all the skills, a spiritual athlete, a successful spiritual person on the outside in terms of the externals. But his commitment to God was lacking when it came to what was absolutely first and foremost in his life. When push came to shove, he could not give it all up. He couldn't walk away from it and be a faithful follower of Jesus first and foremost. And that's why at the end of the day, Jesus summed up his encounter with this would-be disciple with these words. It's easier for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, as we did with the children this morning. External conformity to rules and regulations, the commandments, ten and more, is wonderful. It's a good starting place. But in the end, it's no match for internal, faithful, trusting commitment. Being willing to entirely entrust everything that you are into God's care and keeping. External regulations and rules and duties are no match for internal commitment of faith and trust to God. Only the latter is sufficient to inherit the kingdom of God, Jesus declares to this young man. I heard a story, I believe it's a true story, somewhere in Canada fairly recently. A pastor came to a congregation and he realized very quickly that there was a tremendous opportunity for outreach because the high school in that community was just across the street from his church. And in fact, at recess time and at lunchtime, often kids would come across from the school where they couldn't smoke and light up in front of his church. So he began to think, well, isn't this a great opportunity to reach out to these young people? And so he encouraged a few folk within the congregation to begin to make, uh, build a welcoming team, first of all, and when the young people came over at lunchtime and break, they'd be there in the steps of the church, not just to get rid of them, but to welcome them and greet them, make them, uh, make them feel important, and befriended. And then they went a little bit further, and they began to establish a group that would make lunch and provide a free lunch for some of these young people. And before you knew it, there was quite a crowd coming over to uh, the pastor's church throughout the school time and at lunchtime in particular. And then, you know what, even some of them began to come to church because they had felt this pastor and this team of caregivers were truly uh, caring for them, really uh, putting some priorities in the life of this church. But that's where the, the problem hit. Some of the young people that came over from the high school, uh, their hair was maybe sometimes a little bit blue and sometimes it was a bit pink and sometimes it was a tattoo and this year a, a, a stud or a, and these were the people that began to sit in the front row of their church. And uh, some people thought it was great. But some people began to say to the pastor, you know, they don't really fit into our congregation, you know, pastor. And, and you know, they, they kind of uh, look a bit weird. And sometimes they smell a bit weird. And, and they say weird things. And the pastor said back to them, but they're in church. And the board of elders began to have a discussion about this, and some were in favor and some weren't, but finally the vote was passed, and it said, no, no we're, going to, uh, we're going to shut down that ministry because it's just making us too uncomfortable. It's a true story. It happened somewhere in, in Canada. That decision about priorities. It seemed good on the outside that this group of members of this congregation were doing something. They, maybe they felt good about what they were doing, reaching out to the young people. But when push came to shove and it was a question of who's sitting in my pew or who looks kind of weird beside me in church, they couldn't handle it. Just like this young man couldn't handle 
the full commitment, the full faithful commitment to Jesus that said, put it all beside, lay it all out, and trust in me and me only. That was too much for that congregation. I would ask, is it too much for us? As Jesus confronts us and says, do you want to inherit the kingdom of God? And we say, yes, Jesus, of course we want to inherit the kingdom of God. But then Jesus pushes on and says, look deep. Look deep into what really, first and foremost, is of importance to you. And are you willing to let go of that, to trust in me, to trust that I can do the impossible? If you'll let go, if you'll let the blue-haired, green-eyed, tattooed kids sit in your church and make you a little uncomfortable for my sake, words are not enough. Words weren't enough for this young man. It required a total commitment, a total surrender, as we sang in a hymn just a few moments ago. Do we want to inherit the kingdom of God? Do we want those around us to inherit the kingdom of God? Then it will take more than just words, more than just external declarations. It will take wholehearted, 110% effort, commitment, faith, and trust in Jesus. 110% trust and commitment to allow his love to flow through us. Let us not walk away from the opportunities God gives us. With saddened faces and hesitancy, but let us respond to those opportunities given to us with joy-filled, expectant hearts, ready and willing to take on the tasks that God gives to us for our neighbor's sake, for Jesus' sake, for our sake. Let us bow in prayer.